Um, it's been a very interesting afternoon. And um, I guess what I'm going to do now is take the conversation um, to India a little bit and talk about how um, post-colonial productions kind of play the fool. So I want to start with um, a quotation from Twelfth Night. Foolery, sir, doth walk about the orb with the sun. It shines everywhere. Now, it's common practice in a kind of academic discussion to, to talk about fools and folly in culture and literature by noting the fool's personal status as a licensed outsider to the body politic and to emphasise the, the presence of figures who throughout time and across cultures are employed to provoke laughter by depicting the absurdity of the human condition. So foolery can therefore be seen as the means and the laughter is the end. Foolery is not subversive in itself, it only comes into its own when it gathers its audience to its cause. The fool's fooling finds a twin in the laughter it elicits. I use the word twin because doubling or mimicry is so important to the dynamic of power and subversion, and to the fool's relationship to the master and society. And indeed, if we carry this figure to the place of performance, the audience's relationship to the stage. I'm therefore going to focus on several pairs of fools here. Both in Sanskrit literature and in two of Shakespeare's plays, Twelfth Night and King Lear, and post-colonial performances as playing the fool to mainstream ideas of Shakespeare. The doubling here is in the mimicry of appropriation. Indian Shakespeare performed in India and in the UK with the added framework, of course, of monetization. Theatre is commissioned and performed to order, a relationship which echoes that of master and fool. Buffoonery reaches back to the tradition of the Vidusaka in Sanskrit literature, and it has significant presence in the plays I consider here. Post-colonial buffoonery laughs so much at post-colonial seriousness by very measure of not taking itself seriously. It appeals to what might be considered the basest or lowest type of humour, a subaltern sense that is not usually considered socially acceptable. By a slapstick, the physical, the buffoon undermines perhaps more attitudes of power than any other kind of fooling. The wise man, or centre of power, is forced to reflect on undermining force of mimicry, becoming what he sees reflected, only human, only equal, perhaps a deeply subversive proposition. Now Twelfth Night emphasises the undermining ambivalence of twinning and mimesis, while King Lear offers the professional fool, the madman, and the pretend fool. Both plays explore the seeds of reason in madness to show us that some are born mad, some achieve madness, and some have madness thrust upon them. In post-colonial terms, Twelfth Night is sprinkled liberally with references to the other places and rests on the idea that uncivilised folly, madness, and almost sexual deviance is allowed in an exotic setting. Sir Tony called Mariah, my metal of India, a statement perhaps of her preciousness, but also of his sense of ownership. Here is also an invocation of a dreamed Indian subcontinent casting its power over Shakespeare's imagination. Strikingly, it is Mariah who orchestrates the folly visited on the unwitting Margolio. She is the conductor of foolery, the leader of rebels, and overseer of Toby and his comrades Andrew Aguchik, both quintessential buffoons. Now, King Lear to me is the play for post-colonial India, the key play. Its emphasis is on the devastation that arises from dividing a country, its feudal order giving way to mercantile capitalism, its treatment of servants and of women in state and family via its discussion of dowry, all attest to this. Feste, the melancholy, the melancholy wise fool without a master in Twelfth Night, seems almost to have wandered into Lear's court and found himself a new home until he is usurped by real and pretend madness. Shakespeare draws the link between the two fools in these plays and the echoes of song. Even while Feste proclaims that foolery shines with the sun all over the globe, both he and Lear's fool lament that the rain, it raineth every day. The doubling, bittersweet nature of fooling and the validity of the, reading these plays as buffooning post-colonial commentaries are illustrated in this note on their complementarity. Now, King Lear and Twelfth Night have also recently been performed as post-colonial appropriations in ways that absolutely place them as speaking foolery to power. Atul Kumar's improvisational devised piece, Nothing Like Lear, directed by Rajat Kapoor, is a monologue based on Shakespeare's play, performed across India in 2013. Kumar's Twelfth Night was commissioned and performed at the Globe to Globe Festival in London, 
as part of the Cultural Olympiad in 2012. Both productions are imbued with a spirit of buffoonery. They double, mimic and play buffoon to fixed ideas of Shakespeare's canonical and reverent status. How these productions speak in relation to post-colonialism's post traditional concerns, hybridity, identity, and the relative status of folk versus classical drama, and Gayatri Spivak's key question, can the subaltern speak, very my thinking here. Now, in one of the few articles that track the Vidyashaka along Shakespeare's Fool, alongside Shakespeare's Fool, Keith Jeffers takes the position that though the Vidyashaka is absurd, he is not, like the modern Western absurd, a challenge to the values of his context. This telling reference to values suggests a difference of respect towards authority encoded in the cultural mores of Sanskrit drama, that the audience or reader is not encouraged by or through the Vidyasaka to laugh at the hero's values, in other words, question power and its status quo. Instead, according to Jeffers, the Vidyasaka exists to give the audience some kind of human relief. He is bald, homely, a gourmand, who, rest, who resonates on an utterly human wavelength. In her seminal work on the fool in history, Enid Wellsford writes, the buffoon may be regarded as a fool because although he exploits his own weaknesses instead of being exploited by others, although he is no real or pretend madman, but merely an absurd ne'er-do-well, nevertheless, he resembles other comic fools in that he earns his living by an openly acknowledged failure to attain the normal standard of human dignity. The similarity to the Vidyasaka is clear. She goes on, the buffoon, however, is a slippery customer, and it will be as well to postpone further generalizations as to the nature of his occupation until we have actually watched him at work. With this in mind, I find that the emphasis on the body, on greedy hunger, that defines the buffoon and the Vidyasaka echoes in Twelfth Night and in King Lear, not necessarily in the character of the fool per se, but in other characters who fulfill the human criteria that the buffoon represents. In Twelfth Night, we've got Sir Andrew Agichu, whose central concerns are music, food, entertainment, and Sir Toby Belch, whose very name references gluttony, and they are the buffoons who at once connect with the baser desires of the audience, and that, as Jeffers notes as a Vidyasaka in Sanskrit drama, as a counterpoint to the signs of more elevated, romantic, heroic love. The attitudes of these two do not undermine such love. Instead, their foolishness is a burlesque embodiment of the appetite, an antique distortion of life, a funhouse mirror that mocks, but does not actually modify the original. This is in Jeffords' definition of the Vidyasaka. Meanwhile, in King Lear's Act 1, Scene 4, Lear calls over and over for his dinner and begins to taste the reversal of his position from king, not to fool in the sense of being wise or profound, but buffoon, hungry and embodied, human for the first time in the play. His own fool affects this reversal through the modalities of buffooning by a crude song and mimicry. Lear, when will you want to be so full of songs, sirrah? Fool, I have used it, uncle, ere since thou made thy daughters thy mothers, for whence thou gave them the rod and put down thine own breeches, then they for sudden joy did weep, and I for sorrow sung, that such a king should play Bo Peep and go the fools among. Though the speech does not label Lear buffoon directly, the whole first half of this scene is imbued with an emphasis on buffooning, greedy, lustful righteousness that supports supports Lear's remaining sense of majesty and so offends Goneril. When she names this buffooning, it dissolves, and Lear becomes aware of himself as the terrible, tragic hero whose values are under question and whose identity is under threat. Now my point here follows Jeffers' identification of the function of the buffooning Vidyasaka in some Sanskrit literature as the maintainer of rasa or tone of a performance, balancing the central emotion or mood. In the case of Twelfth Night, this is a hilarious, almost hysterical sense of time, love, and a society gone topsy-turvy, while in Lear, it is the rising tragedy of identity that reaches its crescendo in the storm. As the madman, the faker, and the professional fool line up to judge the terrors of imaginary daughters, Lear's fool drops his prophetic needling tone and becomes a supporter to his master's cause. Cry you mercy, I took you for a joint stool, he says, in a rare moment of playing along. Now directors often have the fool buffoon with a wooden stool to underline the love the fool feels in his desire to vindicate his vision. 
In this deeply human moment, the fool does as the audience might wish to for Lear. The intensity of the scene is not dispersed but enhanced, and is terrible in its implications because of this. So does the buffoon connect with the audience outside the boundaries of the play. He also frames and surpasses the temporality of the plays and exists as a foil to the action. Fools reminds the audience of the uneasy blurring of reality between the stage and life. The tone they create is deeply unheimly. In the two Indian appropriations of Shakespeare that I'm going to talk about now, buffoonery works similarly as a central and subversive tendency by making absurd notions of human dignity. In this hybrid mode, buffoonery works to establish the whole performance as a critique of bardolatry through the engendering of laughter. Wellsford notes, the buffoon is a spiritual as well as material parasite. He can only be himself in congenial society. He is nothing at all apart from the companions who enjoy and encourage his antics. When he is really successful, he breaks down the barriers between himself and his patrons, so they too inhabit for a moment a no man's land between the world of fact and fiction and the world of imagination. He is an educator inaccurate, in the inaccurate modern sense of the word, for he draws out the latent folly of his audience. In the Mumbai theatre notes to Atul Kumar's Nothing Like Lear, the he is replaced by the it of the performance as a whole. Kumar's notes on the production state that to see, to see King Lear through the eyes of a clown is to see him as a man, as a father, as an outcast, as a child, to view a fool through the eyes of a fool. A single actor on stage, an old crown, an entire life lived within the tempest of the theatre. The search for Lear brings us to the eye of the storm, the self. Grains of fiction surge into personal narrative to cover vast distances as the clown looks into Lear, who looks into the clown, distorting where one begins and the other ends a whirlwind where Shakespeare's pages are strewn about only to resurface as a murky collage. <coughs> Here, the emphasis on the world of stage, referencing the melancholy Jacques of As You Like It, hints at the place of performance in relation to audience, a collusion that encompasses them in folly and play. Now, Kumar's character was devised to be a middle-class Maharashtrian man traveling to see his daughters by local train, an armed jumper, to use the Indian term. To Kapoor and Kumar, he became the embodiment of Lear. Yet his language gibber was gibberish, smattered with phrases of half-remembered Shakespeare. The director found this to be a most expressive mode of communication and decided to use this as the narrative mode. The fool inhabits his master's body with a hybrid voice and became not Lear's fool, but a Vidusaka and Groucho Marx combined with a thick moustache, glasses and wide-brimmed hat white face makeup was added, a Chaplin-esque ill-fitting suit, and an oversized pair of spats with black and white shoes that immediately evoke both clowning and a gentlemanly status. In Kalidasa's 4th century Shakuntala, the Vidusaka says, why am I consumed with a craving for food? In nothing like Lear, narcissistic love, desire and need for domestic succor, and more explicitly, hunger and violence are equated with food. The symbol for Cordelia becomes Kumar, shaping a melon in the air. The three daughters are represented by a knife, a fork, and a spoon. Now, inasmuch as various contemporary critical readings, including by Ian Carter, Edward Bond, and uh, more contemporary critics, including Ken and Ryan, have challenged the idea of King Lear as offering sublime cathartic transcendence through the trajectory of Lear's character, nothing like Lear foregrounds the presence of the fool to explore through the whole performance, depression, sadness, all kinds of depression, the fine line between laughter and sorrow and a smile stretched wide. In doing so, the performance sets itself up as a buffoon to traditional Reed Stratford or London King Lear's, where the towering majesty of the lone actor essaying Shakespeare's greatest role is much touted in the media and to which critics and audiences duly despond with appropriate awe. Lear does not have to be this, Kapoor and Kumar seem to be saying, seen through the hybrid lens, speaking in a gibberish more emphatic than any known language, eliciting laughter on his own terms as a fool, and connecting to the audience on the level of base physicality. He can be and is so much more. An uncomfortable thought may be, because the sublimity of Lear is difficult to let go of. Nevertheless, an interesting one, 
through which to consider the relationship of post-colonial Shakespearean appropriations to the centre as a whole. Now, Kumar's Globe to Globe Twelfth Night, or Pia Berupia, made these points far more overtly. Commissioned by the Globe to Globe Festival in 2012, tagline 37 plays in 37 languages, and the greatest festival of Shakespeare the world has ever seen, directors were expected, as David noted, to abide by the rule that no English was to be used on stage. Despite protests from Kumar that English is the language that his company in India speaks, <laughs> and stood, enter a buffooning sense of play that challenged this on every level and colluded with the audience to do so. In Act 3, Scene 4, Saurabh Naya was on stage, Smalvolio, wearing his yellow stockings cross-gartered and waiting for Olivia. He dreams of food, a marriage bed, a life of satiated bliss in which his mistress is so besotted by love that he never has to serve her again. Here are all the sensory traits of the Vidhisaka buffoon. In her analysis of Madhajani Manjari, an adaptation of Twelfth Night in Marathi by Vidya Gokhale in 1965, Poon Trivedi notes that it was so popular that it totaled more than 161 performances across India by 1995. The adaptation followed the plot fairly faithfully, including Malvolio as Livia Stewart, cast in the image of the buffoon or the Dushaka Sanskrit drama, forced to wear garish stockings. In Kumar's production, the laughter was elicited on decidedly post-colonial terms. In Malvolio's repost to Sir Toby, he imagines himself as a sahib and corrects Toby in Mariah's English with English, even though Toby is actually Malvolio's superior in terms of class hierarchy. Later, imagining his wedding to Olivia, he says, Sirta Bananga Bara Sakraun, or Sara Dunya, though I will look down. <laughs> on my head, I will wear a big crown, and I will look down on the whole world. <laughs> the use of the word crown recalls a demand for obedience to empire here, and a subversion in that it was worn by a character made into a buffoon. Here is the echo of both Shakuntala's Vidusaka and Lear's Fool, mocking attachment to hollow status objects, in the case of Shakuntala, a ring, in Lear's case, a crown. Amidosh Naupal was the translator of the play The Twelfth Night um, on the Globe stage, and he also took the role of Sebastian. Interrupting the performance to address the audience halfway through the play, he acted the buffoon to make all of the Globe his stage. Translation ki job ma kasan se itne thankless job hai ya, mein aake laine sunare hoon, ho to kera hai, wah, Shakespeare kamar hai, he said. This is a translation. Um, the job of the translator is truthfully a thankless one. I come and tell them a line, and every, everyone says, wow, Shakespeare's the best. <laughs> he linked his position in any hierarchy as a fool, dependent on the director's pleasure for food and safety, and he qualified this with a real awareness of who was really in control, the English organisers. He followed this with a buffooning attack on the idea of revering anything too closely, English or Indian. Shakespeare he told the audience. Okay, fine, he said. Let's do Shakespeare in English then. Doing thee and thy and thou over and over has shrunk Gandhi's loincloth. <laughs> he actually did this in the middle of this production. The joke works on several levels, against the authority of Shakespeare, against the mythology of saintly Gandhi, uh, the loincloth is pretty small already, <laughs> against the authority of Shakespeare, uh, which has said, uh, audiences who worship both. We are all just human, Hag Pal seems to be saying, and why should we not laugh? Later, festival director Tom Bird said that the hybrid result of Kumar and Naipaul's insertions added greatly to the humour and audience enjoyment of the play. What Naipaul achieves here is absolutely in line with what Viola, in her admiration of Feste, praises when she says, this fellow is wise enough to play the fool, and to do that well creates a kind of wit. He must observe the need on whom he jests, the quality of persons and the time. This is a practice as full of labour as wise man's art, for follow fully as he wisely shows is fit, but wise men, folly fallen, quite take their wit. She reminds us of the necessary function of folly to keep us equal and indeed sane by measuring and critiquing the needs of the times. Prentke argues that Twelfth Night is a play that sees the sets the licentiousness of an exotic carnival against the parsimony of Lent. Taking this positioning into the post-colonial context nuances the play as firstly an exotic imagining that contrasts 
this staid classical interpretation of Shakespeare, but it also asks us to see this play with its buffooning rasa as subversive to its center of origin and breaking away from a relationship of master-slave or colonizer-colonized to find a new space in which to laugh back at those in power, be they producers, directors, or critics, and to encourage audiences to do the same. Buffoonery, commonly used to depict lower-class humor in Indian Shakespeare, and indeed cinema, connects us to those on the margins, men and women, the spivaks, illiterate peasantry, the tribals, the lower strata of the urban subproletariat. It reminds others of a wider humanity, even as it challenges classist ideas of dignity. If everything that has limited or no access to the cultural imperialism is subaltern as Fima Parker a space of difference, then post-colonial Shakespeare's under review by Western cricket critics certainly do occupy that position and space. The foodie post-colonial Shakespeare's do more than simply remind us of the marginalised though by representing them through the foodie. The laughter they evoke occurs in the space between two centres and can be claimed fully by neither. Practice and performance are fueled by the fluid creativity that is found in theatre, particularly folk theatres typified by buffoons inserted into a reverence of Shakespeare and a voice consciousness by which a subaltern might speak. The argument might falter if it were true that subalterneity can no longer be applied to post-colonial Shakespeare in relation to the imperial centre. Analysis of critical reception in India and in the UK proves this not to be the case, however. The sense of otherness and selfhood of measuring up is still inherent in the production of critical reception, even if by their very decisions, performance itself challenges this. In Nagpal's asides, a critique of Atul Kumar's need to bow to the economic rules of cultural production and his own desire to subvert them. The lesson does seem to have taken root in the later, nothing like Lear, with its use of distinctive and most speaking gibberish. Now listening carefully to that voice, one hears and understands the important profundity of absurdity. In the melancholy yet hypermix of past, present and future that the laughter of the buffoon elicits is the idea so carefully translated with the necessary ridiculousness in the Mahabharata that time cooks all beings. In its hybridity, a buffoon can escape this fate. Representation here becomes a slippery fish we cannot catch, and nor should we be able to, if buffooning is to maintain its status, at once outsider and intrinsically part of ourselves. Thank you.